Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for joining me this morning. I called this press conference today for several purposes. Uh, first, I want to announce adjustments that are being made to the safety network moving forward. Also, I want to discuss SNET, its trademark, and its status moving forward. I want to discuss matters of integrity, transparency, and community engagement as it relates to SNET and the Cure Violence Assessment. I want to provide an update to the Cure Violence Assessment and share information on the recent gun violence that we've seen in our community from 20, January 2022 up to date. I also want to answer any questions that you may have as it relates to any of these items. And I'm willing to remain until all your questions are answered. Politics, personalities, bureaucracy, and what I would call a media frenzy have gotten us away from the original focus of the safety network and really created distractions uh, from the important work that has taken place over, the, over this past year as it relates to gun violence reduction. I want to first provide some background information and describe the work and discuss how we will move forward. And so I have a few slides. I won't go into detail with some of them, but they're for reference and more detailed information. I think all of you have copies of, of the detail. A year ago this month, um, I assembled a group of individuals at the Peoria Police Department. I had met with then Police Chief Lauren Marion about the rise, significant rise in homicides and who those homicide victims were, who those homicide shooters were, and the impact, the disproportionate impact that it had on a particular community, and that's Peoria's black community. We talked about the numbers, we talked about the, the level of engagement of the black community in terms of community-based solutions. And so I sat down and I made up a list of about 50 people, many of them uh, leaders within Peoria's African-American community, advocacy organizations, responders to gun violence reduction, service providers, those who had a committed interest and a close relationship uh, to services for serving this community. And I called them together with the police, probably about the chief and uh, interim chief um, and um, several, excuse me, the chief at that time, uh, several of his team members and the community came together at the police training room and we talked about the problem. We talked about the causes of the problem. Um, but we moved from talking about the problem to trying to work together to identify solutions to address the problem. We talked about connecting ourselves and connecting community resources to really begin to make a collective impact, to make a difference on reducing gun violence, uh, particularly in this community because of the numbers. So we discuss forming a network, a network that connects community resources in an effective and efficient way uh, so that one hand knows what the other hand is doing and so that we can be more practical in our approach. So that's where the concept of the safety network was introduced. Um, it's not a program as it's been uh, suggested, but really a framework that brings together numerous programs, that brings together numerous services and groups and individuals that are connected to address issues of violent crime in Peoria, particularly gun violence reduction. 
So the safety network was formed as a network, a system of connected resources, uh, creating profiles of the various people and organizations, and providing supports. This is just an image of kind of the concept of a safety network where you have neighborhood organizations, you have programs, you have the schools, faith-based organizations, and many other stakeholders within our community that are connected, connected um, because they know one another, they're familiar with one another's programs and services, connected with the police who are part of the network, uh, connected again with the schools, the neighborhood associations, and hopefully eventually residents and businesses in terms of an expanded network. The body of work that has taken place since July of uh, 2021, and again, we met twice at the Peoria Police Department, uh, one week and then two weeks later. Then we met at Proctor Center. Then we met twice at Southside Mission. And then Dr. Karat offered the training room, um, the I think it's called a professional development room at Peoria Public Schools Administration Building. And since September, we've been meeting ever since, twice a month. So that body of work that has taken place since that time has been to take an inventory of gun violence reduction uh, resources, identify the gaps. What are we missing in, in really reducing crime in our community? Um, creating an awareness of prevention resources, developing those collaborative partnerships. And that's really what the Safety Network has been about. People working together, connecting, getting to know one another, another and the services that we have because Peoria has quite a, quite a few services, but they've been disconnected. Safety Network has connected many of those services. But to focus on those higher crime areas, and at some point use technology to alert, connect, and in, inform partners that are associated with the network. The safety network has ex explored many different types of um, possibilities for programs and services, and has especially focuses on evidence-based, community-based uh, violence prevention or gun reduction type programs. And that's because we wanted to not start from scratch, but to identify those programs, those initiatives that have already proven successful somewhere else, in some other city, in some other location, that, that we're not starting from scratch. We're learning uh, from what someone else has done successfully, evidence-based strategies. Um, the Safety Network has really complemented in many ways the police work that has been done, the great police work that has been done uh, with our chief and his team. I mean, we, it was reported just at the last Safety Network meeting that of the 12 outstanding, um, I think, 12 outstanding investigations that 10 of them had been recently solved. I mean, that was huge. That was great police work. But it also involved the community telling people within the community to participate in TIP 411, to participate by giving information to the police to help reduce gun violence in our community. The community is sick and tired of what is happening, and they want something done about it. So the body of work includes serving as a system that supports police and community uh, service provider that helps build local capacity to secure external gun violence prevention funding. And let me tell you, there's lots of it available now. And through our network, we've assisted several organizations in getting funding for after-school programming, for youth development, for capacity. Um, uh, improving the capacity of an organization to actually serve in this way. I want to thank the members of the Safety Network who have stuck together over this past year and put in the work, put in the time, their own time, 
in trying to not just identify the problem, but identify solutions to gun violence reduction. And here's a list of many of those partners to date. They include many within the police department, many within our schools, including the, the uh, administrator, uh, superintendent of Peoria Public Schools, several of her principals, principal of Peoria High and Manuel, um, several of her um, security team. It includes many different service providers, community-based organizations. Most of the community-based organizations that you could name have been associated with this effort. The health, public health administrator, members of her team, Illinois Central College, staff, and I could go on, but many partners have participated in this effort. And I want to thank them for the work that they've given. I, I think that um, some may feel unappreciated right now, and I don't want them to feel unappreciated. I want them to feel appreciated, and I applaud the work. I applaud the efforts, and that's what we need. We need people coming together who are dedicated and commit committed to this effort. From the beginning, there was a hope to expand the safety network partners to include residents, businesses, housing organizations. I was happy at the last safety network meeting that we had about six or seven members of the Peoria Housing Authority. I was really pleased to see that. From the beginning, there's always been members of the faith-based community, especially those that are within the hot spots or targeted areas of the city. The Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority in 2021 identified the best practices for gun violence reduction, and those include street intervention, or interruption type outreach and engagement activities. Connected community and resources, that's what the safety network is all about. Counseling and therapy, youth development, case management, and data sharing. That's another aspect of the safety network. And I'll share some of that data today. So up until now, the Safety Network, beginning around September, was referred to as SNET, short for Safety Network. And SNET, uh, again, was a vision that I had several years ago, back in 2019, a vision to bring community resources together to reduce gun violence. I had shared that vision with a group of local ministers. Uh, they embraced it but it wasn't acted on until 20, last year, 2021, when we talked about bringing these community resources, to, excuse me, resources together. And in September, by September, the group was calling itself SNET. Well, that changes now uh, because of the disruption, I would say, the level of chaos surrounding the name SNET. So beginning now, moving forward, the safety network will no longer identify as SNET. The safety network will identify as the safety network. It is and has been a community work group comprised of members of those various organizations and individuals that are just committed to serving our community. We've never been a city commission or an advisory group to the city or the council. We weren't required to give updates to the city council, but I did because I wanted to keep everyone in the loop as to what was happening. Under, until the city took ownership of the SNET trademark, which 
I happily transferred to the city to avoid any perceived conflict of interest. Uh, this was discussed in a meeting on January the 13th of this year. Um, I agreed to transfer that um, trademark to the city without any cost. The paperwork was put together by city legal and ultimately the um, United States Patent and Trademark Office transferred the trademark to the city of Peoria. The safety network, however, will return to operate as a community work group comprised of many community partners and not controlled by any one entity. It will continue to meet monthly at Peoria Public Schools Administration Building on the second Friday of each month and meetings will remain open to the public, but will not be subject to the Open Meetings Act. Again, the Safety Network is a community initiative and not a city-controlled initiative. It is committed to community-based solutions for gun violence reduction. And we must return to the focus to addressing the real problems that we're faced with without any distractions. Regarding the SNET trademark, the city will have to decide if it wishes to retain it, transfer it, or cancel it. My goal is for the city and the community to return our focus to what is most important, and that is working collectively to reduce the violence and to save lives. I wanna talk a minute about integrity because I consider myself a person of high integrity. My former colleagues, my former superiors, my community partners, and those that know me best can attest to my high standards, my honesty, integrity, moral and ethical behavior. I've always been engaging and collaborative when it comes to community and neighborhood issues. So I don't like to work in silos. I need to be able to work with the people to get the work done and to listen to their concerns. It's difficult when you're unfairly accused of hiding something or having secret meetings. There have been no secret meetings. There have been community work group meetings that anyone on the council could have certainly attended. But transparency is something that's very important to me. And again, some of the accusations out there are pretty, pretty darn hurtful when it comes to issues of integrity. So I stand on the premise that even related to the trademark, that nothing has been done illegally, nothing has been done unethically. I am committed to, um, I was, you know, complied in terms of any resolution to that issue and I want to return the focus back to where it should be. So I want to talk very briefly about the cure violence assessment because there's been a lot of, um, a lot of concern about that. Um, it's something that was brought to the council on May the 24th from the police chief. It was a recommendation brought forth from the police chief who recommended it. Um, he's also been a part of the safety network who had studied it, who had explored it, who had had presentations on it, who had researched it. But it was the police chief's recommendation that actually came to council on May the 24th. The council chose not to um, fund that assessment for, for various reasons, 
And so we move on from that. There have been several organizations locally that had, have offered to pay for that assessment, several. Last night, the Peoria County Board of Health did consider paying for the assessment. And I understand that cure, cure violence has been on their radar for a long time, something that they had researched, had an interest in, and had, I think, as part of their strategic plan. But the Board of Health did approve the authorization for the public health administrator to enter into a contract with the Cure Violence Global Organization to conduct the local cure violence assessment. This allows them to have this option moving forward, and, and I thank them for taking that on. I want to share some numbers with you um, on the recent gun violence. This is a report that was provided by the police chief to council uh, yesterday uh, via email. This is the first time that, that you're seeing this. And it shows since January 1st through July 18th, yesterday, it shows the number of shooting incidents in, in the city, the number of shooting victims, the number of shooting murders, and then all murders. And you will see that compared to this same time last year, that in all those areas, we're down. We're down 35% in shooting incidents. We're down 28% in shooting victims. We're down 27% in shooting murders and 18% down in all murders. That's good that we're down, but there's been a spike here recently, especially in the last three to four weeks. The trend is, is not good. So this next page is a list of the 2022 homicides from January 1st through January 18th. It identifies the case numbers, the date of the homicide, the location of the homicide and the victims. And I want to say that although there's a case number associated with these victims, these are human beings. These are human beings. Human beings that have families and friends. Most all of them are members of our Peoria community. All of them lost their lives to gun violence in Peoria. It's a crisis. I want to take it a little bit further to take a look at the demographics. Of the homicides in Peoria this past year, there's been 14. 13 of the 14 are black people. 93% are black people. Now this is, I'm saying something that people don't want to say. People don't like to talk about race. It's a difficult and it's a sensitive subject. But these are the numbers that we can no longer ignore. 93% of the homicides are black people in Peoria. Eight of these are black males and five are black females. The shooting incidents from January 1st through July 18th, 98% of the shooting incidents are black victims, 55 out of 56, 55 out of 56. This is why the black community in Peoria must be engaged. This is why we must listen to their cries 
for help. This is why the chaos must stop. This is why we must return to the important work. These are the numbers that we cannot ignore, and this is not just a black problem. This is a community problem. This is a city problem. And it's going to take a committed leadership, a committed city, a commitment of resources to really turn this thing around. Our leadership must be sensitive to issues of race and culture. Our leaders must engage in these discussions and not delegate them. And I'm talking about discussions on race within the city of Peoria. We can now, no longer delegate these discussions. We have to be a part of them. We should not assume ill intent and we should not assume malice. We have to seek first to understand. Tonight's policy session will explore how local resources might be allocated and I look forward to tonight's session. I want to see reconciliation within our city council and between the council and the black community. And it won't happen overnight. It will begin with a demonstrated commitment, a commitment with a similar focus and a return to the focus on gun violence reduction. So with that, I, I will open up for any questions that you may have. Well, the city, fortunately, uh, last year launched its Racial Justice and Equity Commission, one of the largest, if not the largest, commission in the state of Illinois, and a very unique commission of its type. And the commission has a steering committee and eight focused committees, uh, subcommittees that focus on different areas of racial disparity like housing, the justice system, transportation, um, child development, um, health care, various areas where there's large and gaps and disparities. So we have 150 people talking about race in those discussions. We held uh, that group held an annual report where they reported out about those dis their findings and how they're gonna move forward with their discussions. We need more city council presence in those discussions. Even at that annual meeting, there was, other than myself, I think there was one other two, maybe two council members. So we need more engagement of the council rather than to say that's their work to discuss race. It's it's our work as leaders. We have to be engaged. And some of those discussions happened with the safety network. The safety network talked about the impact of gun violence within the African American community and the whys, the problem. And it's very complex. It's not one thing. And it's not going to take one thing, even a cure violence, to fix it. It's going to take a multifaceted approach going to take many people involved, many different resources, many different strategies that hopefully come together to address the issue. But, but that's what I meant when I said we can't delegate it. We have to be a part of it. We have to better understand it. I don't know that it's going to be addressed tonight because I think the focus is really on the resources that are allocated, that will be allocated for uh, violence reduction. Um, I've, I've spoken to a couple of the council members that have made some harsh remarks. And, you know, we've had some conversation, not necessarily agreeing, but at least talking. And I'm all about talking. My door is always open to discussion because really it begins Healing begins with talking. And so I, 
I'm happy to talk to, to anyone that wants to talk to me about these issues, especially those in leadership. And, um, but it, it can't come from a place of harm or false accusations. You know, I'm, I'm a member of a new cohort. It's called Mayor's New Cohort. New Mayor's Cohort, I'm sorry. It's called the New Mayor's Cohort. I've been a, a member of it since I was sworn in. But it's comprised of women, new women mayors, and new mayors of color. And it's really like a support group. And we're mentored by experienced women mayors and experienced mayors of color. And, you know, we were warned from the very beginning that because of your difference, because of your newness, because of your gender, because of your color, you're going to be held to a different standard. You're going to be held to a different standard. You're going to be scrutinized more than, than the other guys. Um, and yes. What I'm saying is that being, you know, I've been a woman and I've been a black woman all my life. And I've also been a, in a professional in professional settings all my life. And just because you're in professional settings, government settings, doesn't mean that there are no double standards anymore or there is no, you're not looked at, uh, you're not treated differently. You still, gender and race still come into play at times. So I'm, I'm, you know, not pointing any fingers, but I'm just saying in this role as the person that I am, you're oftentimes under a bit more scrutiny than the status quo. You know, I do, I'm part of a, a regional mayor's alliance, so I do have communication with uh, regional mayors. Many of them are not having the same level of, of gun violence uh, that we're having. So, you know, I, there's other mayors, like the mayor of Rockford, who um, is a, a fellow colleague of mine, and we share some similarities in terms of what's happening within our city, so we bounce things off of one another. So that's probably where I lean more in terms of an understanding of, of what we're going through here in Peoria. Yeah, you know, um, and again, moving forward, we're not SNET anymore. We're the safety network. Um, and again, second Friday of every month is open to the public. The media can be there if they so choose. But we'll have to decide, you know, how we want to communicate to the public in terms of where we're at in this work. Uh, will that be quarterly um, report out? Possibly. Uh, but I need to, to talk with the group. Yeah, similar to other groups that I'm a part of, community work groups, uh, we um, chose not to make that a city appointed commission. It would be a pretty darn big commission. Uh, with 50 people and, you know, the council deciding, well, who's going to be on this? It's, it's so formal that I think it would have really kind of taken away from the effort. Uh, the idea was to meet for a period of time. Ideally, it was going to be about six months, and it ended up turning into almost a year. Uh, but the idea was to meet with a manageable group of people who were very close to the issue and to try to identify the problem and some some uh, solutions, community-based solutions. And we've done that. And, and then to begin, and not to stop doing that, but then to begin to open it up. 
very similar to the group that I started meeting with in August of last year, almost a year, on passenger rail. So we've met as a community work group and discussed, you know, how we want to move forward, who we need to work with, what additional partners needed to be brought in, like the partners along the rail line, and we have a conference this uh, Thursday, but s very similar to, to that. And um, so that's, that's how it was structured as a community work group. And I met with legal in January because there was some criticism from a, a local resident um, who never asked to come to the meetings, by the way, but there was some criticism that the public couldn't, wasn't invited to the, the meetings weren't open for the public. And so I met with our attorney who said it's a community work group, just like the rail group, and it did not have to be open to the public. Yet again, we at one point wanted it to be open. So last, um, uh, actually July, the, the second Friday of July, it was open to the public. Pardon me? We were working to get things done without having an open town meeting. It's very, I've, I've been involved you know, and community work for a long time, and I've seen how town meetings happen, and you have, you know, anybody can come, anybody can be disruptive, um, and you don't always get much done. So we wanted, just like the rail group, we wanted to get things done, a and I would say we've been very productive, and you have to be ready. You know, there's something called this concept of I'm going to say it wrong, but it's about norming and storming, how a group comes together and they form trust and they build relationships. And they be, once they build those relationships, the norms begin to form and they begin to make progress. Every time somebody new comes into the group, it starts all over. The norming, storming, and there's another word that I'm forgetting, but it starts all over. And so... Um, we wanted, we have formed those relationships over a period of time. We were getting things done in a trusting way, working with the police. I mean, this is what has been exciting about the safety network, that there, you will, you talk to some of those individuals and some of them will say, I've never worked this close with the police in my life and never thought that I would. But I'm sitting next to the police and I used to be out in the streets. And now I have these positive working relationships with the police and the chief and the assistant chief and, and you know, the captain. So forming those relationships, working closely with the police is, is what has been taking place over this past year. And now it's, it's time to engage more people and bring them into the network. So there were several uh, presentations that were made to the safety network. One was called Change the Narrative. And that was a presentation by Mr. Jonathan Romaine of Art Inc. And he really talked about how we need to, especially with these young people that are kind of focused on um, keeping up with their peers, uh, getting attention, and getting involved in some negative things, how we have to change the narrative from the negative to the positive. And he talked about doing that with relationship to messaging, the messages that they see, the messages that they hear, how we can create positive messages. Um, and so he applied for an R3 grant through the state of Illinois, and they were awarded 600 thousand dollars to help change the narrative in Peoria. That presentation first came to the safety network. Uh, there were some capacity building uh, proposals that uh, were funded by the state of Illinois that were first presented to the safety network. There were some uh, Carver Center made a proposal. They got funded from the state for an after school uh, program. So there's been several um, programs that have been funded and many more to come because there's a lot of state money, not just the local money. And I'm glad that we have $7 million in local dollars, but we're also trying to access 
other resources outside of the city funding. And it, it takes working together because most of that money requires collaboration. You're not just working solo on your own, you're working with other partners, collaborative partners in the community. Well, the way that, from what I understand in talking with uh, Monica Hendrickson, it, it is considered an option uh, for the Board of Health. They've actually authorized her to enter into a contract, and it's written as an option if the City Council does not decide to fund, but the City Council has already explored that twice. So in my opinion, um, you know, hopefully the City Council will go forth with an implementation of funding for implementation of cure violence if the assessment proves that we are viable, that the city of Peoria is a viable place to implement cure violence. So I, I think it's a dead issue in terms of the city reconsidering the assessment and hope that the Board of Health will go forth. Yes, sir. You know, I, I think that there's a lot of people that want to be involved, that do understand. And again, the safety network, even though it started out as predominantly black people and black leaders and service providers, it has diversified, okay? There's a lot more participation among people um, that are uh, white, um, Asian, um, other individuals that just are concerned or they are connected to a service organization. So, and I think we've seen that even at the last uh, meeting, Safety Network meeting, we saw more people come and attend. So I think the message is, this is not a black problem, this is a city problem, we need resources, we need dedication of individuals to be able to solve this problem. That's a good question, and you know, again, race is a sensitive issue, and I've, I've worked in the area of race relations and diversity, equity, and inclusion, multiculturalism, all those things that you wanna call them. I've held discussions on race within the community and within organizations that I've worked with. It's a sensitive issue, and people need safe space to be able to talk about issues of race, and we have to create those safe spaces, even for our leadership. Uh, we have to create an environment where people feel more comfortable talking about issues of race. Um, and I wanna help to do that. I really wanna help to do that. Sometimes I think that we need sensitivity training. We need more um, education and training on racial justice and equity, not just for other people, but for us as leaders. I think that's really where it starts, um, is everybody can learn more about race and race relations and understanding our, our differences. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to us considering those things too, is how do we get there? And I think we have to, First, be committed to uh, working together to get there. I would like to see that. I, I think that I think that there's a lack of understanding on why, say, the NAACP would hold a press conference. Um, why people. 
of the black community would be angry at decisions that were made or comments that were made around the decisions that were made. Um, I, I think that these discussions with the community, not about the community, would be more productive in helping our leaders to understand the whys. Why? Why are people outside City Hall protesting or um, holding a press conference, making certain assertions? Let's seek first to understand why. And that's what I think we can, we can be more sensitive to. No more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.